This is Amateur Logic, episode 130, for May 15th, 2019. This episode of Amateur Logic is brought to you by MFJ, the world leaders in ham radio accessories at mfjenterprises.com. And by ICOM. Create your own band opening with ICOM's newest SDR transceiver, the IC9700. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Amateur Logic. I'm George. I'm Tommy. And I'm Mike, filling in for the cheap old man. Yes, Mike is the uh, guy with the French name tonight. Yeah, he's playing that part. The, oh, we're supposed to do like on the soap operas. The guy with the French name is being played by Mike Morneau <laughs> this week. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, let me get the organ fired up over here. Uh... <laughs> Boy, it has been a busy month for me, it seems like. Yeah, uh, yeah it's really it's been busy been, for everybody. Been spread out, man. I, yeah. and there's still plenty more to go. Yeah. I, I've, um, well, I was out at the swamp today. The transmitter out there quit, and the water is so deep, I just, I need to go out to the towers, but I just said, you know, I'm not going to wait out through that with the snakes. Uh, I need to get to the know. station to buy you some kayaks. Yeah, well, the sawgrass is in the way. You need an airboat. That would do it. That would work. That would do it. Also, moved two transmitters within the past week or so, which, you know, at 1,600 pounds, that's a little difficult to move. And I found out that there's a skunk living on the transmitter building. Oh, that's a <laughs> so, root. I bet nice. you know, it's an eye opener. Yeah. A nose opener. So it's been a banner week for me. Sounds I, I like gotta it. Got to say. Well, what's been going on with you, Tommy? Well, I just got back uh, from uh, another trip out of town. It reached the end of my project that I was on, so hoping thing, hoping that life's going to slow down a little bit, maybe not quite as much travel. Yeah. What about you, Mike? Uh, not too much, but uh, not much to report also. Um, I did have a question, though. Am I, uh, am I acting comp compliance officer or acting com compliance officer uh, or you're deputy? Just just basically just acting. Well, that's well, good. Yeah. Well, we don't I wouldn't I wouldn't want to be expected to do the real thing. <laughs> no, no, no. And and we wouldn't expect you to. You know, nobody can fill those shoes like Emil. And uh unfortunately he well, I won't say unfortunately he's having a good time. He's where is he? Indianapolis? Yeah. Uh Michigan, I believe he's somewhere up in Michigan. I thought it was Indiana. Maybe it is Michigan. Yeah. Um yeah, he's got uh, his son. Some t his son's team built a car, yeah. or something, and they're up there uh, showing it. I think it's some kind of competition. But I keep seeing him on Facebook. It looks like he's having a great time. He should be back for next month. And that's a really sweet looking ride. I I wish we had a photo of it. With it, I didn't get a photo for well, tonight. Yeah, I might be able to dig one up before the end of the show. Okay, so there I you go. Maybe I posted a few. I bet you can. Well, Mike, what has been going on up to the north there? Uh, not much. It's uh, it's odd weather uh, this spring, if you want to call it that. I I thought we were we were about to head right into summer, uh, from winter. Um, but then it got cold again. For some reason, it's only been oh a few degrees above freezing at night. Um, but it warms up during the day. It's actually kind of nice weather uh, for working outside. Um. The bugs aren't out yet, so that makes it even better than the, than the uh, the weather being a little chilly. Oh, uh, they're already at full force here. Oh yeah, and it's boy, it has been raining a lot the last week or so. It's uh, we, we've got a lot of flash flooding going on, and probably some regular flooding. Yeah, you know when it makes the national uh, news, yeah. it's pretty bad. Yeah, and uh, it's been hot. 
it's a cold front that's supposed to be moving in, but it's probably, what, close to 70 degrees, so it doesn't feel like much it of a... It didn't feel cold today. No, it sure didn't. Yeah, some folks, uh, I about a 40-minute drive north of me, uh, there was some flooding there, and I think it's been somewhat mitigated. It hasn't peaked yet, um, but with the, uh, the colder or cooler temperatures, I should say, it's slowed down the melt from the snow. And uh, apparently it's uh, it's not going to be as bad as what they re were originally intending it to be. Well, that's, that's good. I, I do want to mention, any time we're doing a show, what are we doing at the same time live? Uh, we've got the chat room going on over here. So you can join us at amateurlogic.tv forward slash chat. And uh, the usual saying is if you're watching the live stream, and you're not in the chat room, you're only getting half the fun. Yeah, and I'm not going to go into my usual jokes. Mm -hmm. Which at, half? At, yeah, which half? <laughs> so, yeah. I was going to mention these shirts we're wearing. What does that shirt there say, Tommy? Yeah, it's uh, music. Turn around here. Music Memorial yeah. Radio Station. ZL1ZLD. Suburban Amateur Radio Club. Oh, mm -hmm. Ink. Ink. Yeah, I didn't catch the ink on there till just now. Um, New Zealand. How did yeah. we end up in New Zealand? Where yeah, tonight? buddy uh, Kevin Mitchell uh, came through. He was passing through and sent us a message, and we met up with him, and uh, he gave us the shirts and some other goodies. We're going to pull out here, I guess, towards the end of the show. Yeah, Mike, we're going to do a taste <clears> test <throat> uh, toward the end of the show tonight, and you know, it's always fun to to try foods from other parts of the world. And we've got an old favorite here, one that we learned about a year or two back. Oh, yeah. Uh, yep, yeah, I think it was two, must have been two years ago. Two years ago. And, and we've got some new things here we haven't tried either, but Kevin brought some uh, great treats from New Zealand, and we're looking forward to trying those out. And I'll just, I'll just go ahead and tell you now, there's no what we consider nasty stuff in the bunch nothing really salty or vitaminly yeah flavored. so i'm sure that's probably disappointing to you guys <laughs> but from this side of the camera we're okay with it yeah that. yeah <laughs> we're looking forward to it for change <laughs> uh, it's always fun but uh, i i think it'll be good yeah it was good it was cool us. to meet him uh they flew in and they've got basically a whole whirlwind tour of the United States down here, the lower 48, they're driving all over. It looks like a fun time. Yeah, I think they started where in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and they drove across, and they they stopped by here, and we visited Yeah, one night. And, uh, yeah, and they're going, going down to Florida, Florida and back up to Dayton. So we'll mm -hmm. see them again in Dayton. Yeah. And then they go back across the northern part of the country, back to L.A. to fly home. Oh, yeah. And the only uh, regret I have to our visit, it was just too short. Yeah. Yeah. But, but we'll get to see him again in a few and that's, days. Here. That's Kevin uh, ZL1KFM? Yeah. Uh, he's apparently uh, heading for Dayton Hamvention this year. Oh, yeah, he is. Not yeah. Dayton Hamvention, but Xenia Hamvention and Xenia this year. Yeah, yeah. He said we're gonna, we'll see him there. Yeah. Um, yeah, real nice guy, nice family. So looking forward to that. Yeah, it's, um, it's going to be a fun time. And speaking of Dayton Hamvention or... I guess they still call it that because it's the Dayton Amateur Radio Club that puts it on. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's at the Xenia Fairgrounds. Now, we'll be leaving. Well, I'm leaving out about the crack of dawn on Thursday morning. Yeah. You're, That's how you got your tickets a little less than me because I'm not leaving at the crack of dawn. Yeah. So I leave around noonish, ish little afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so looking forward to a big time there, uh, hoping for a good weather year and uh, a good flea market year, maybe. Yeah, you maybe better take, come your, home uh, with something. take your raincoat and your gum boots with you. Yeah. I, I heard the, uh, well, I, I don't generally put a lot of stock in any forecast that's beyond the third day, but um, things are looking uh, pretty good this year. Uh, I think 20% uh, uh, probability is is uh, is the highest for any of the three days. It's not supposed to oh. rain until Monday. Oh, uh, we're just judging so. from here, it pretty much rains continuously. So, yeah. Uh, so that that would be awesome. 
Yeah, it started sometime last year and hadn't quit yet. It feels like that. Yeah. Well, I guess we should get on into other parts of the show here. Yeah, still plenty of fun to be had. Yep. And we usually do a few emails and um, social media posts and stuff like that at the top of the show. And I'm going to pronounce his name wrong. It's A-B-I-M-A-E-L. Abimael. Abimael. K-P-4-R-Y. He said, Hi, George. I'm interested in a Rigol DS-1054Z. This oscilloscope works for spectrum analyzer and audio. 7.3 KP4RY, and it actually does, it would work great for audio because as stock it goes out to 50 megahertz, but there is a firmware that you could download, at least you could when I bought mine, and, and uh, step it up to 100 megahertz, and it does have a spectrum analyzer function in it if you've got the add-on math packages there, which I, I think you can find those as well without paying a fee for them if you're real diligent. And it gives you a spectrum analyzer function too. Now the spectrum analyzer that you're going to get in there it does work and you can see signals on it but it's not uh, as high a resolution or as, um, as good as say a, a regular spectrum analyzer would be. But you know that's, that's a lot in a small scope. Mm -hmm. uh, for that price, you, you get a lot in there. So I would recommend it. And he works, I believe he works at Arecibo. Oh, wow. Yeah, the giant, yeah. The giant dish. Awesome. That's some of the things. I've, I've said so many things are on my bucket list. I can't die for probably 200 years. But that's actually <laughs> one of the things on there, too. It's something you'd have to see. I saw Val's tour of it. And yeah. Boy, amazing. Yeah, it looks interesting. I want to mm -hmm. see it in person. It's a, it's a lot more um, interesting than skunks under a transmitter building. I can tell you that I for sure. I man. That'd be pretty tough. To... Yeah. <laughs> um, I didn't know you had pets out there. Mike, do you have any kind of post or anything you'd like to discuss tonight? Uh, not really, George. I guess uh, it's it's still with Hamvention going on uh, soon. Um, it's too early to talk about Field Day, but uh, I, I know I'm starting to see uh, chat about Field Day and the uh, social media already. So folks are are getting geared up for that already. And yeah, I've, well, not exclusively for Field Day. I have done some things toward that end that. Uh, octopus antenna that we looked at yeah, recently. Little prep. Yeah, a little prep there, and we, we've got that ready to go and some other things. We're just hoping that maybe it'll quit raining by field day. Ah, oh, man, I hope so. I yeah. hope so. It was nice in here with the air conditioning and everything, but I'm ready to get back out in the woods. Yeah. That's two years we've had to yeah. skip it. It's not really field day unless, you you know, you have to wring out your T-shirt Yeah. And after you get everything set up. With with you folks having so much rain down there, how long would it take for things really to to dry up with no rain? Uh, within a a week. Yeah, it it dries out pretty fast. Yeah, if we get sun, it it dries out pretty quick. It just gets very humid. Yep, that's the other side of it. <clears throat> anyway, yeah, field day. Um, it's not too early to start thinking about it. No, it's just around the corner. It's barely a little over a month away. Really? Is it that close? Well, this is May. It's like around the 25th of June. Oh, wow. I'm not prepared at all. I thought I was making some <laughs> headroom, but I, I guess I got to get busy. Uh, I don't have the exact dates, but that's a, it falls around that time. So what are you talking about tonight, Tommy? You've got an interesting subject here. Yeah, I've, I've kind of stumbled across some stuff. You know, I have a lot of time in the hotel playing around, and I ran across something. Uh, it's kind of a little bit of a follow-up from a previous segment I did a few years ago. Well, I'm out of town on a work trip again. I ran across a really cool website. It's a little bit of a takeoff of something I did years ago. Uh, anyway, it's uh, pretty interesting. I thought you guys might like it. If you remember, I did a review on the WebSDR.org site a long time ago. And while it's very cool, there was a very limited number 
of, of uh, SDRs on there online. And it, you can see now it's grown quite a bit, and that's great. But I ran across another one. It's called uh, OpenWebRx is a software, but the website is SDR.HU. So let's take a look at it. Let's click over on receivers. There are 406 receivers online here. 372 people listening at the moment. So that's pretty cool. Uh, you can look at the ones over here that have the highest number of votes. You can check the most popular ones. The software is uh, open source and you can put your own SDR receiver online. I've got a segment coming up soon where I'm going to be putting a, a RTL SDR dongle on uh, online using the Raspberry Pi, so stay tuned for that. But let's take a look at the software for right now. You can see what kind of hardware they used. If you look, you can see where they're located. Um, this one is in Italy. It's on HF and 0 to 30 megahertz. If you click on it, it'll take you right in there. Click Start. And you've got the familiar SDR interface. We can click on the waterfall and find uh, activity to listen to. This one is uh, goes from zero to thirty megahertz, which uh, that's a lot of bandwidth. Uh, most of them. Let's go back over here. Most of them are limited to the bandwidth of the device. So the RTL SDR ones, I think they're typically like, if I remember right, 2.4 megahertz of bandwidth. Um, it's not a lot, but it's enough for uh, to, to have some fun online with it. The Kiwi SDR devices seem to be pretty popular. So let's uh, let's take a look at another one. This one is uh, in Idaho in the U.S. Try to find one that's got some activity on it. Hundred to a thousand a day moving to Idaho. Somewhere in that area. That's a lot of people moving to Idaho. Coming from California. So let's uh, five megahertz. So this one's set up. You could listen to uh, WTWW or whatever from here, assuming it's uh, the band is cooperating. I'm trying to find some good activity. So, you can change the different types of modulation that you want to listen for. We've got AM, AM narrow, lower sideband, upper sideband, CW, CW narrow, narrow band FM, and IQ. So, anyway, so it's, that's pretty cool. It's very flexible. You can type in, on some of these, you can type in your frequency. So I'll put in, uh, uh, I think 3850 is a popular 75 meter. And you can see it jumps to the frequency. So it's, pretty, it's pretty nice. If we go over to FM, well, let's, let's find a different one. So... A lot of them cover different ranges also. Out of 400 and something on here, there's something for pretty much everybody, I think. So these are HF. This one's 1.5 megahertz in Greece. There's one in Switzerland on HF. Here's one in Northern Europe. Let's see what happens on this one. I need to look into these Kiwi SDRs. Uh, apparently there's quite a bit of bandwidth on there. I'm not familiar with it. Here's a Raspberry Pi 3 and an RTL SDR in Germany. This is on 2 meters. Let's see if there's anything on 2 meters. So th this is a good example. The center, when it comes up, the person that set it up on the system sets up the center frequency so this one's set at 145.6 
and you can see it goes to from 144 to 146 so that's two megahertz of bandwidth and that's typical for the RTL SDR dongle so that's going to be the limitation of your bandwidth you can control the squelch on these two meter ones uh, on the FM ones there's a squelch slider right there that you can squelch out the noise level let's try some more Australia Collie, Australia. Not quite sure where that is. There's some CW. Sounds pretty good. Uh, you can see it's still zoomed in apparently. So let's go back over here, see what we've got. AM station. Switzerland. That looks like quite a lot of noise. To fine tune it, you can slide the marker, but you have to do it slowly because there is some latency between here and the server over the internet. So, well, this one is not one to let me slide it, but some of them will. You can also do it with the keyboard. So, what I do is click on it. Puts the cursor there, and then you can use the left or right arrows on the keyboard to move. Well, you, <laughs> you can see it's working. I have no idea what they're saying, but if I spoke the language, we'll probably need Arnie to decode that for me. But it does work. It's a cool site. There's a lot of controls on that little control panel down there. Noise, noise blankers, squelch control. Um, it's, it's very full featured. You can see that it's pretty versatile. Um, there's their receivers out of 400 receivers online right now there's something all over the world pretty much and covering a lot of different bands I was so fascinated with this I went through the steps of trying to set my own up at the house and I got my little RTL SDR dongle working I can listen to it locally across my network but I'm just going to put it on the uh, internet and then I'll probably make another segment coming up sometime in the near future on how to pull that off with a Raspberry Pi. Um, anyway, it's, it's really cool stuff. Um, go check out the site, sdr.hu. And uh, anyway, let me know what you think about it. I think it's a, it's a lot of fun. Good way to pass some time if you're away also. 73. Three or four years ago anyway. Um before those RTL SDR dongles uh, were popular, uh, the soft rock kits. I don't know if you remember the soft rock kits. I think you built yeah. one, George. Yeah, I built a couple. Um, yeah. They uh, started putting a few of those on the on the web, and um, I think when I when I looked at that website, there was only like four four to six uh, different uh, uh, stations you could listen to at that time. And now, how many did you say, Tommy? There's there's a ton of them. Well, there now. were there were over four hundred on there at the moment. Wow. Um, so some of them come off and on. Um, so anyway, that that's a, that's a lot. Wow. That... And there, and more. It looks like more and more at being added. I, I got it to work at my house. The software. I've got it all compiled. It's all running on my Raspberry Pi, and I can use it locally. I just didn't quite. I had to go out of town before I got time to register it on the site. Mm -hmm. So I'll probably do a segment coming up here sometime soon on how to do that. Yeah. You, you know the. 
the group that I talk with when I get a chance to get on HF, there, there's me here in Mississippi. There's a guy in Nashville, uh, uh, a guy in Louisville, and then some various other folks scattered around. But with those distances, sometimes the band conditions are such that everybody can't hear everybody, and we'll connect to an SDR that's out in Utah or somewhere, and you can hear the guy that you're not hearing uh -huh. through that. It, it you know just gives you another a little further out so that you're not kind of like in the the mm. skip over zone. Yeah, well, that's cool. Yeah, check it out. If, uh, if you're sitting around, you know, nothing to do, want to listen to a different. It, you can listen to a lot of things on your own uh, shortwave receiver here, but it's nothing like having an antenna. Different parts of the world. So. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, Tommy, what have you got for your first email there well, tonight? I do have a first email. We'll see what it is. Oh, it's a follow-up to my peanut segment I did a few months back. This is from KB0TSJ. thought you might make a follow-up to the peanut story, and he sent a link to PA7LIM David's website on how to add a reflector to peanut. Pretty simple steps there, so... Just follow those and should be able to add another reflector to it. David's got quite a few already. Looks like it makes it pretty easy to add others. PA7LIM dot NL slash Ambi server. Yeah, so um, there's, a, there's a really key point to there. It's uh, make sure you have the permission of the admin of the reflector before you go doing that. Always good to be a good citizen, get permission. Stuff, do stuff like that but uh, appreciate the link i uh, wasn't aware that that was out there yet so it's pretty yeah. cool stuff it is we may actually do that at some point in the future as well it'll be a fun segment yeah well we're going to take a break here and uh, we'll be right back but we've got a little video here this is actually going to be an ad for uh, one of our sponsors mfj but this video is from Howard Nurse on a great project. We showed you here, I don't know how long ago it was. Was it two years ago at the 45th anniversary? Is that yeah, I think it was it two was? years ago as well. And so this has been in development for a long time. But he he teamed up with the, the folks at MFJ and and some other people who do some open source software and have a really... Mm -hmm. Nice, interesting package here. We'll be we've looked at it before on the show two years ago, but we'll be looking at this again soon. But but for now, let's let's let Howard explain it. Hi, I'm Howard W6HN. I'm excited to tell you all about the new MFJ one two three four RigPi station server. Let's get started. A long time ago, when digital computers were first invented, it took specially designed rooms and conditioning filled with racks of equipment, hundreds of vacuum tubes, and elaborate consoles to do simple arithmetic. Up until the early 70s, the thought of having a computer in your shack was nothing more than a dream. Since then, the size and cost of computers has come down to the point where computers are an important asset in any well-designed shack. The behemoths of yesterday are no longer. This is the RigPi station server. It is a small, economical, Raspberry Pi-based computer system that controls your station and handles on-the-air activities. What can RigPi do? Using a browser on just about any device, RigPi provides radio and rotor control, CW King, VoIP for two-way audio, logging, DX spot monitoring, and a fact-filled web view showing details about other stations. Using the RigPi desktop, you can operate digital modes using popular programs, plus you can upload your log files to the ARRL logbook of the world. Finally, it can replace a desktop computer with a browser, email client, word processing, and spreadsheet programs. RigPi is great for use in your shack, but for remote ops, it really shines. RigPi is well suited for Apple and Android devices, including mobile phones, tablets, iPads, and more. 
work DX while on the road or from a cruise ship. Let's listen in on Tom, W5KUB, as he works Walter, KI4V, in Tennessee from a cruise ship somewhere in the Caribbean. Here is Walter, KI4V, previously NR3E, working HK3C in Columbia. We are trying out, we're beta testing a RigPi remote unit. I'm actually on an iPhone, uh, remotely connected to a friend's TS570. Well, very good. Very good, thank you, and uh, congratulations on the remote setup. It's sounding nice. So that uh, rig pod looks pretty cool. Um, it looked yeah. it looked uh, interesting when we saw it at the MFJ anniversary day over there. So I'm glad this finally hit the shelves. I am, and you know the software looks really really nice uh, on it. It does. It, but can you imagine that? Just um, most I'd say most modern rigs are supported with it, and you just plug that uh, little rig pie server into your rig. To your audio connections and your uh, cat connections, and you and you you can carry around your HF rig on your phone or your iPad. Yeah, I'm going to use mine for field day. Are you? No, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you can do that legally. But this, is, oh, just remote back into here. Yeah, yeah, with the <laughs> amplifier and all, it would be nice. But but no, um, a great it'd be a great thing for you when you travel, man. Yeah, no kidding. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. So may try that out from the may have another uh, segment from the hotel room. Yep, coming up. Cool. Well, Mike, you have been working on a, uh, I would say, audio over the internet ham radio related project. That's uh, well, this is a sequel too, huh? It is, and it's been a while since we did the first one. Um, I think it was episode seventy six, if oh. I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that was uh, where we used the Raspberry Pi and the uh, DV3000 or the Pi DV board from uh, Northwest Digital Radio. And um, yeah, this is kind of along the same lines, but uh, we're going to be running it on Windows and Android, and it, uh, it uses the Thumb DV or, or the, uh, the similar dongle from, um, from um, uh, over in Europe. And um, I believe there's some other one out there that uh, came out not too long ago as well. So uh, there's a lot of stuff going on with uh, Ambi uh, dongles and uh, being able to operate uh, the various digital systems with uh, just a headset uh, or a speaker and a microphone. Blue DV Ambi for Windows and Android. Previously on episode 126, Tommy showed us how to set up Blue DV with a Northwest Digital Radio Thumb DV. You may recall a project that George and I did a few years back. It featured the Northwest Digital Radio DV3000 Pi DV board that plugged onto a Raspberry Pi and was configured to run as an Ambi server. It allowed you to connect and communicate with other Dongle and D-Star radio users over the various D-Star networks using just a microphone or headset. It can be confusing since many popular devices such as the DV4 Mini, DV Mega, OpenSpot, etc. do not have integrated AMBI chips, so there's no audio encoding decoding capability with these devices. They are simply hotspots and require a corresponding digital radio to communicate. David, PA7LIM, a Dutch radio amateur who lives in Utrecht, Netherlands, has written a number of Blue DV applications. In addition to David's popular Blue DV applications, he's been working on experimental Blue DV Ambi for Android and Blue DV Ambi for Windows versions. If you visit his garage, you can follow this project and find out about recently added features as he continues to develop this amazing app. We'll be connecting an Ambi 3000 device, a Northwest Digital Radio Thumb DV or DV Mega DV Stick 30 to a Windows PC and then installing and running the Blue DV Ambi server application. Next, we'll install a Blue DV Ambi app from the Google Play Store. 
the Windows PC will be our AMBI server, which will connect via the internet to the various DSTAR and DMR networks, and we'll use the BlueDV AMBI for Android app on our tablet or smartphone as the communication and control device that will connect via Wi-Fi back to our Windows PC slash AMBI server. If I chose to, it would be possible to run everything directly from one of my Android devices using an on-the-go OTG cable by attaching either a DV Mega DV Stick 30 or Northwest Digital Radio Thumb DV Stick directly. Okay, let's get started. On your Windows device that you'll be using as the AMBI server, open up a web browser and download the latest BlueDV AMBI server zip file. When the download is complete, run the installer MSA and install. Once you are happy with the default install location, click Next. When complete, you should find a BlueDV AMBI server icon on your Windows desktop. If not, look for it in the Windows Start menu. Click Launch. This next step is optional, but check the Auto Start box if you would like the AMBI server to start up every time Windows is started. In most cases, you shouldn't need to change the client IP address and port number, but we need to make note of this IP address. You'll need to confirm the COM port number that your dongle is assigned to and select it from the drop-down list. If you don't recall, look in the Windows Device Manager, and if the USB dongle and driver is working correctly, you should see its COM port assignment here. Depending on the age of your AMBI dongle, it will be one of the two baud rates listed in the drop-down list. Ensure that you set the correct baud rate for your device. The default UDP port number is 2460. Normally you should not need to change this. If you should ever need to stop the AMBI server for some reason, just click the stop button. Tommy showed us how to configure the BlueDV client software and demonstrated the operation. However, there are just a few changes that we need to make in order to connect to our AMBI server instead of locally attached dongle. The section in red are where those changes in your BlueDV client settings need to be made. Be sure you save your changes. Now if everything is working, your BlueDV client should indicate AMBI server connected and you should be able to connect. Well, that's all for this BlueDV AMBI segment, 7.3 from VE3MIC. Is that like sort of having your own bag of peanuts? <laughs> I guess, I guess <laughs> if it's free, um, uh, the, the thing about it is that I like is uh, you don't have to worry about having a dongle attached. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of folks are running... Uh, smartphones or tablets with the uh, with an OTG cable mm -hmm. and they have the uh, thumb DV device connected directly to the uh, to the device they're actually using but with the AMBI server you can just leave the AMBI server running all the time and you can you can switch I've I've done it um, I'll just open up the phone I'll launch the uh, blue DV for AMBI app uh, that's on my phone or or tablet and uh, away I go it talks over port 2460 and um, I've tried actually having two devices running at the same time, but I, I have one of the older dongles uh, that runs at the slower baud rate, so it gets a little confused, and I don't recommend people actually do that, especially with the uh, if they have an older dongle. There just isn't enough, uh, uh, well, not bandwidth, but um, a data rate uh, for it to work properly, so... Um, I just, uh, you know, make sure that I close off uh, one device before I go to try to do it on another one. Yeah, yeah mine's one of the older ones as well. That's pretty cool, though. I yeah, I yeah, like that's neat stuff. It's uh, pretty nice. Um, you just don't need a lot of uh, overhead either to run that uh, AMBI server. Um, I'm running mine on an old um, uh, Windows netbook uh, with... Two, uh, two gigs of RAM on it, although it's it got the up, the free upgrade to Windows 10, it still only has two gigs of RAM. And um, it's only got one of those Atom Core processors in it, so it's, it's really low overhead. And uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is, um, I know some, some, some guys have tried it, um, but I don't recommend it unless you've got a private VPN. Uh, and that is, um, They've opened up port 2460 on their router, and they've connected to their outside IP address, and uh, and they've run it remotely from a hotel room or something. And um, you can do it, but the thing is, uh, you're leaving yourself wide open unless you've got 
you know, some other means of uh, tightening down to security, like a like a private VPN or something like that. KC3 uh, BFY Tom, he made a comment about only running Windows 10 with two gigs of RAM, and it's like, yeah, it's not <laughs> recommended. But I was really surprised when they offered me the uh, the free upgrade because I only had the um, I can't remember what they called the Windows 7 version that I had, but it wasn't wasn't home edition it was something else it was like like a light edition of windows 7 um hmm. and uh i was really surprised when i got the notice that i could upgrade to windows 10 so i said what the heck i'll i'll give it a try and sure enough um you know after hmm. some time installing um and everything it uh, it worked worked just fine i i don't notice uh, too much lag i mean it's not the zippiest uh, machine in the world because it's only an atom core processor uh, running on a netbook, but uh, and two gigs of RAM, um, but it does the job for the Ambi server just fine. I've got one of those netbooks, and uh, I gave up. It came with XP, and I gave up on it, and I ended up putting Linux on it. Yeah, but I don't ever turn it on. I haven't turned it on in years. I wish I could find a decent use for it. I think my Raspberry Pi is probably faster than it. Ambi server. Maybe probably the Linux. probably the new uh, 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 version threes are likely. Uh -huh, most likely. Okay, so you ready for the email? Yeah. Okay. Well, I've got one from Eric, W four EMT. He says, uh, "Hi Tommy, I wanted to let you know how much I enjoyed your segment on the last Amateur Logic on the Peanut Windows software. I enjoyed listening and watching when I'm working on something." I like to have the local repeater on in the background. I've heard about the Peanut Android app, but since I have an iPhone, I've not been able to take advantage of it yet. I have an iMac at home, but run Parallels so that I can play with other OSs, including Windows. When I saw your segment, I downloaded the app and discovered that it's really as easy as you said to get it up and running. It's not as configurable as a Dev app or something like my OpenSpot, but you can't beat the price, and all it needs is access to the Internet. I've heard lots of international QSOs on available D-Star reflectors, as well as the English rooms. Thanks for sharing it with us. It's really an amazing app. By the way, I have Lord of the Rings naming convention for our computer devices and home network. <laughs> <laughs> My VM's appropriate name, Mordor. One doesn't simply log on to Mor into Mordor. That's pretty funny, but I actually went with the, uh, well, I'm probably going to run out, but the Marvel Comics names, I've got uh, Jarvis is one of them from <laughs> Iron Man. I was going to try to come up with something unique, but anyway, that's what we got so far. But anyway, I'm glad you like the uh, the segment in the Peanut software. It's, it's pretty nice. Uh, it's, it's hugely popular. Oh, Amazing. Yeah. Eric. W4EMT. Mm -hmm. Do you remember who that is? The call's familiar. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Eric yes. Clark and his wife, Sarah Clark. They were our grand prize winners. Oh, sure. Well, that's yep. where. Okay. Yeah, that's right. That, uh, I should have remembered that. Yeah. They got, they got the sweet prize. This yeah. Yeah, it's I'm a, sure they're still enjoying that. Sure. It's 13th anniversary, was that? Yeah. Yeah. Lucky 13. Lucky 13 it was for them anyway. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks, Eric, for for writing in there. And I happen to have an email here, too, and this comes from John Powell, GW4LPB. And he says, hello, George. And, and I, I think he was probably watching Ham Nation episode 311 from August of 2017. He said, hi, George. I've been watching your YouTube production about the Pinto, and I thought I'd let you know how much I enjoyed it. Very clear and informative. Just rebuilding my Paraset and wanted to know a little more about how the tubes actually work. I've read a lot of written information, but sometimes they get a little too deep for me. Thanks again. Enjoy Sunday, GP4LPB. Well, John, I'm glad that you enjoyed that. More to come. But right now, we need to take another break. 
turn on that air conditioner for about uh, 120 seconds. That is a fantastic idea. And we'll be right back. Create your own band opening with the IC9700. ICOM's newest SDR transceiver, the IC9700, this new radio is bringing direct sampling to the UHF-VHF weak signal world. The IC9700 all-mode transceiver is loaded with innovative features, such as dedicated amateur satellite operation, color touchscreen, built-in D-Star capability, RF direct sampling on 2 meters and 70 centimeter bands, dual independent receivers capable of full duplex operation as well as dual watch, 100 watts maximum output power on 2 meters, 75 watts max on 70 centimeters, and 10 watts max on 1.2 gigahertz. Visit icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information on all the great ICOM radios. Attention all hams! ICOM knows that ham clubs play a big role in bringing ham communities together to learn from their peers and industry leaders. As a way to give back and help you on your mission, ICOM has launched a promotion exclusively for U.S. ham clubs and the ham fest they're involved with. By registering your club, you could win ICOM swag, a Skype presentation for your club, or your ham fest an ICOM booth setup. Register today for your chance to win at icomamerica.com hams. Pack your bags because Dayton Hamvention is coming up from May 17th through 19th at the Greene County Fairgrounds and Expo Center in Xenia, Ohio. See the latest and greatest ICOM gear and meet hams from all over the world. And if you're going to Hamvention this year, then I want you to go to icomamerica.com slash amateur and get the details to register to win one of their uh, great 2019 ICOM swag prize kits. Y you remember... It's been so long. It was back in February, I think. Of what year? This 2019. This February. Yeah. This past February, I decided to revive the Echo Link Pi project. And I went with the Raspberry Pi 3 and SVX Link. You know, last time I just didn't have any luck with SVX Link. It stuttered. Yeah. Um, very limited success last Yeah, very. Time. Very limited success. Uh, this time, things have been a little bit different. So I showed you part one of this segment in February, and it was my plan to show you the conclusion of it in March. Well, I got kind of sidetracked on other things. And what about April? Well, I did in Still April as well. Still sidetracked. <laughs> well, we, we brought out... Uh, Windows 10 on a Raspberry Pi, and that seemed like... That was a good one, though. Know, that was a good one. And then the Octopus antenna and the uh, the shortcuts and the tips for setting it up. That Yeah, that was pretty good, too. So you get a pass then. Yeah. That'll work. I did get back to it, and actually, I solicited some help from an outside so stranger. From somebody I may know? Somebody you may know. Cool. Now we need to make the GPIO work. I've got the same thing I built here. Years ago, for that other Echo Link Pi project, if you remember, I used the conductive paint to make this PC board, really just filling in the spaces here on some perf board. And it's a simple transistor, diode, and resistor. One end goes to the GPIO connections, plus five ground and the pin that we want to use. The other end has a DB9 on it. The reason that it has that is my current Echolink interface plugs into a PC, and I'll just plug that same cable into this. And now back to the configuration section of the website. We're going to work on the GPIO. The first thing we need to do is add SVX Link to the GPIO group. And then we need to stop SVX Link and stop the GPIO setup. And I'm going to use GPIO4 as they used in the example here. There are instructions right here for modifying the GPIO.conf file. And I'll follow those. I did follow the instructions and my GPIO interface just wasn't working. After much troubleshooting, I tracked it down. I'm just going to say if you have any of these circuit writer type pins, the ones that have conductive ink in them, Throw them away. They're no good. It has been a few years since I made this board, but I didn't expect that the resistance on the traces would increase with age. It did. 
And then I discovered, yeah, that's a problem with these type of pins. So I had to go back on the interface here, and you can see I added jumper wires across everywhere I had previously used the circuit writer there. And then the I.O. seemed to work fine. Way back in May of 2006, in Episode 7 of Amateur Logic, I talked a little bit about Echolink, and I showed the Echolink interface that I built for connecting my radio to a computer for Echolink. That's what I'll be using here to connect the Raspberry Pi. And you'll notice on the schematic, I still had my original call sign. I'm ready to test SVXLink on the air now and see how it operates. Here's what we got, the Raspberry Pi, the sound card connected to the interface that I showed you a moment ago, and the GPIO interface. And it's all connected to a Radio Shack 2 meter rig that Tommy actually owns. It's an HTX212. I'm using this setup to run Echolink on a local repeater. It's W5PPB-R. So I won't use the QTEL interface that you would use if you were just operating this in a standalone simplex operation. But also I won't use the repeater logic on SVX Link because this is not connected directly to the repeater. This is operating over a 2 meter rig to get to the repeater. So the first test I'm going to take out my Android phone here and I'm going to call into the repeater and see if we can get connected. Welcome to the W5PPB repeater located in Sharon, Mississippi on 145.45 megahertz with a 77 hertz PL tone. And that message is customizable. What's happening is an infinite loop there. The Echolink node is hearing the squelch tail off of the repeater, and that causes it to key up again, which causes the repeater to key up again, and it's just a vicious cycle. So I'm going to do a little editing to correct that. I go to the SVX link CONF file, and we'll edit it to change squelch start delay, and I'm going to set it to 4000 because... I timed out the squelch tail on that repeater. After you stop transmitting, the repeater will stop transmitting just over three seconds later. So by setting this to 4,000 milliseconds, I should be able to avoid that loop. I'm ready to test it out now, so I'm waiting on a call from Tommy over Echo Link. Let's see if we can get connected and talk. Activating Echo Link. Connected November 5. Zulu November Oscar. Well, good evening, Tommy. Uh, it looks like you got connected here on Echo Link. Well, that is me. I'm the, I'm the sysop of the W5 PPB repeater. What's going on this evening? Yeah, QSL. You've got a little bit of a long squelch tail effect there. Um, but anyway, it looks like you got a promotion. I didn't realize you got a promotion to sysop. Does the raise come with that, too? Well, your audio sounds pretty good here. I would say it sounds as good as the regular Echo Link did on the repeater here. Yeah, QSL, your sounds good as well. I'm using my iPhone from uh, work at the moment, but uh, anyway, it sounds really good. Hey, which sound card are you using? Well, I'm using this little cheap sound dongle. Remember, I, I used it six years ago on the first Echo Link Pi project I made, and uh, you know, it seems to work okay for this. Oh, yeah, QSL, I remember that. I've actually got one of those still in the drawer. Um, I haven't done anything with it. Maybe if this works out okay for you, I may build one for myself at the house. Yeah, I'm going to have to actually put this thing on the air full time. Right now, there's just wires strung all across the shack here, connecting it up to the radio. But it looks like it's going to work, and um, I I'm going to give it a little try and give it some time on the air and see how it works out. Well, I tell you what, why don't we disconnect, and I will try calling you back. Thank you, SL. That'd be a good test. I'm not sure how well that works on a phone like this. So let's give it a try. November 5, Zulu. November, Oscar. Disconnected. Deactivating. Echo link. November 5, Zulu, November, Oscar. Connected. Looks like it worked. I found you out there on Echo Link Land. 
Uh, well, this is this is good. Uh, I've got good hopes for this one. I think maybe SVX Link is going to work for me this time. Yeah, I want to just tighten up that scrub tail just a little bit. That's probably not the right term, but uh, we know what I mean. But yeah, I was kind of surprised that it connected. It. Uh, I've never really used Echo Link on the phone like that before. Yeah, and of course there's some lag in there. Your your lips are not in sync with the video we're seeing from Skype here, but that's to be expected. Well, um, I appreciate you uh, checking this out with me tonight from an undisclosed hotel room. And if it looks like I'm just looking off into space or ignoring you, I'm not. It's just that the monitor I'm looking at is over there, but... It, I should look this way to look at you, I guess. Uh, that's okay. It's, uh, it doesn't matter which direction you look in. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah, I would try to look both directions like I did in the last episode, but uh, my eyes kind of got stuck for a few days after that. Yeah, you're probably going to have to take some Advil after that. Yeah, it, it took a good knock in the head to get them straightened back out, but it, it's all better now. All right, thanks, Tommy. I appreciate it, and uh, I, I'm going to put it on the air and and leave it for a while and see how it works out. 73 and 5 z and O W five jdx All right, 73, I'll talk to you in a few days. And 5 z and O. November 5, Zulu. November, Oscar, disconnected. So there you go. The SVX link appears to work. We will give it a good shot on the air and get some feedback and see how it's working out. I'll let you know in a future episode. 7-3. That's really cool. It, it, it's alive. It works. Yeah, it worked pretty well. The other thing that surprised me is that's the first time I've ever gotten a nickel link call on my cell phone. Yeah. I didn't really realize that worked. I never really thought about it. It don't work every time, as we discovered. Yeah, yeah but it does work. Yeah, you kind of had to make initiate a connection first, I guess, to get registered on the system or something. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, really, uh, well, I've got it on the air over here right now. So we're going to try it for a while. And if it seems solid, I'm going to mount that little board somehow on my Raspberry Pi case and just leave it on the air full time. Cool. Seems seems to be working good. And and uh, I'm sure it, I'm sure Emil would uh, give it his stamp of approval, being comp compliant and all. Yeah, because I didn't buy anything. I already had all of that stuff. Now you're using uh, the uh, GPIO uh, pair of the pins for the uh, push to talk. Yeah, well, yeah. The just, COS. Uh, I believe I was to ground in just one of the pins. Yeah, and I installed the wiring pi library on on the raspberry pi but all the details were there um in the the first episode of the spx link project uh february of this year <laughs> and you know i stepped you through and i told you what websites where i didn't uh give you every single step they're all there uh between what i told you and what you can find at the links i showed that's all you need to know to get it up and running. Now, I did uh, do some customizations to it, uh, a few more than I showed there. Not many, though. And, you know, most people who install that on Raspberry Pi will probably run the little server that goes with it. There's a little QTEL server uh, or um, GUI that you run along with that, and it gives you a user interface to use for for simplex use for single user but since i was using it for a repeater you know i just went with the bare mm -hmm. svx link there and well, that's cool yeah that's really cool I'd, I'd like to try something like that uh there's another project uh that's pretty popular called ham voip um where you use a similar audio uh usb dongle on a raspberry pi but it uh, connects to all star um mm -hmm. So I'd like to give that a try sometime. Well, we're going to be back just a minute with that promised New Zealand taste test. Uh, hey, how about just watching this and let us get set up for it?
At the end of each month, it's Amateur Logic's Ham College, the new show for those new to the hobby and those wanting to get into amateur radio. Which of the following is a purpose of the amateur radio service as stated in the FCC rules and regulations? That inductor and capacitor form a tuned circuit. That's how you tune the radio to the frequency that you want. The English language. We lived in town. I liked it. I, I listened to mine a lot. It was really cool because you didn't have to have a battery to power yeah. There's our homemade telegraph station. We can use it for long distance communications. Oh, like, uh, what, three feet yeah, here? across the table. The answer is B. Voltage was named after Italian physicist Alessandro Volta. We can see we're generating a little bit of electricity there. It's DC. It's always great to go back and get a refresher. It well, sure is. A lot of that stuff, if you've been a ham for a while like we have, you, you don't really think about a lot of that stuff that often. They didn't have electric screwdrivers in those days, so that's why we're not using ones. That's why we went stores. primitive with it. Yeah. So let's see if we can hear anything when we, uh, we fire off our spark gap transmitter. Well, we didn't build anything or blow up anything today, but... Uh, the night's still young. Well, it's not so young anymore, but... No, but we probably won't start any fires with this unless we have too much of it. So this one here is an old favorite, huh? Oh, yeah, man. This is uh, good stuff. LMP. Lemon and Parola. Good, good lemony stuff. Says it right there on the mm -hmm. label. It, it is good. We like, like that. Yeah, Simon brought us a, a bottle of this back... Uh, Oh, I don't know. A two, year, two years ago, two I think. Two years ago. I don't think he came last year. Kevin saw that we liked it so much, he brought us another mm -hmm. bottle of it. Yep. And he brought us some other goodies, too. But first, let's let's uh, let's get on right in. I think what uh, Paroa was, was that mineral water? Was I don't that some know. some kind of special? I don't know. I, it Let's was something it special in New Zealand. I remember that much. <laughs> so I'll pour me a little bit here and of course I like my lemon and Paroa over ice and as you know as we said earlier we don't really have any uh, really nasty foreign food <laughs> with this yeah I know you're disappointed out there yeah but we do have what looks to be some pretty good things here. And yeah, that's not really transparent. That's just the green screen effect there. Pretty nice things here. Ah, uh, yes. You know, you know these, Mike? Absolutely. Dairy milk and crunchy. Yeah. Crunchy is like a uh, chocolate-covered uh, sponge taffy or toffee. Well, this is crunchy, too. Oh, sorry. I didn't see that. Yeah. Huh, I didn't know they had them in a bar. I don't know if it's the same thing or not. It, it looks a little the end look a little different. That one. Yeah, this looks different. Yeah. They're both Cadbury, though. Both Cadbury. Is that a New Zealand company? Maybe. Yeah. I thought it was uh, British. Cad Cadbury's international, I think. Um, but they're, they're definitely on the higher end of on the uh, on the higher end of chocolate chocolatiers I, I would say packed with crunchy yum dairy milk milk chocolate with chunky golden honeycomb pieces oh that's interesting proudly made in Tasmania awesome awesome you know it's got to be good yep all right it's well I, cool. I think we'll just jump right on into the uh, yeah dairy milk here first. No sense in putting that off any longer. No. No. <laughs> Chocolate and honeycomb pieces. I've never experienced that. No. That's interesting. Yeah, it looked like peanuts on the uh, on the package there, but there you go, break you off a slab. First, uh, toast to our friends in New Cheers. Zealand. Cheers. 
Uh, just as good as I remember yeah, it. Me, yep, me too. It's very good. Did you ever get a chance Anything to that get comes the... out of a brown bottle can't be all that bad in my books. <laughs> Mm. Mm. That's good. Mm. Are your teeth sticking together yet? No, this one's, uh, it's just got a few small pieces. Little oh, small okay. pieces of crunchy in there. Yeah, I didn't know it was honeycomb. It, um, I would have thought toffee. <laughs> but... Honeycomb and milk chocolate go good together. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, that's good. Well, that's, that's there are a lot others. of benefits to doing this show. There are. <laughs> <laughs> be careful. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are some disadvantages too, but. That's right. Oh, actually, you talking about the Vegemite stuff? Actually, I thought that was kind of cool. It was always interesting. Yeah. Let's, uh, oh. let's look at that one. Cadbury Crunchy. And these are individually wrapped for your protection. I didn't know they were dangerous. I have one. Cool. Well, camera's This is like a uh, nice... Oh, and candy treat, I think. Golden Hokey Pokey. I'm not even making this up. Can we switch the camera back to the overhead one? See it will show. Golden Hokey Pokey. Golden Hokey Pokey honeycomb covered in Cadbury milk chocolate. Okay, well, it's sort of the same ingredient as the other. Sounds like. Yeah, it's, it's light, though. It, feels it like is. It's full of air. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, I'll go ahead and be, let's see, let's try it. I'd say let's try it, too. It, it's got to be better than some of the stuff people have sent I us feel bad sitting here eating in front of Mike. No, no, that's okay. I uh, I know exactly what you're getting yourself into <laughs> in a good way. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Good way for you. You try? Yeah. Oh, it's light. This is different than the other one. Mm-hmm. Is that like sponge toffee, covered in chocolate? Yeah. Yep. Same ones. Wow, that is good. Mm-hmm. Wow, thanks, Kevin. Yeah, that's awesome. I really appreciate you bringing the goodies back with over here for us. Yeah. Man, I, I don't think I've ever seen those available here. I, I haven't either. If I do, I'll probably be buying some of them. It's like, it's real light. Mm -hmm. It's a little like a malted milk ball, but it doesn't taste anything like one. But the consistency is. So, mm -hmm. so you've had this one, Mike? Yeah, they're uh, they're pretty popular. You can get them anywhere over here. Uh, I'm really surprised that they don't have them uh, down in the States. I've never well, seen them. They may have, but I, yeah, I've never seen them. Uh, of course, I don't buy much candy either. Yeah. Hardly ever buy anything like that. There's a lot of candy bars or chocolate bars um, branded differently. They're pretty similar, but I got to say that one I've yet to find anything that's that's like like a crunchy that I can compare it to. The only thing I can tell people is it's like sponge toffee that's coated in chocolate. Amateur Candy Logic is the name of this show. <laughs> uh, that's from Arnie. S A seven C A R. He's He's going by his Swedish handle. Oh, now. so incognito. Yep. He didn't want to. He didn't want to show his face here after that incident <laughs> with the burritos. <laughs> Arnie, are you going to um, to Hamvention this year? I, I know we haven't talked about that, but uh, you know, I hope we see some of you guys there. We're looking forward. Yeah, to Yeah, if you see time. us walking around there, be sure and stop and and, and say hi. Yep. Well, we've got a few hat pictures here, Tommy. All right, those are always fun. They are. I think we, I think we may have missed a few hat pictures too. Uh, so we'll have uh, catch up some of those for next month. Yep. 
And the things we just ate right here yep. were courtesy of this guy, Kevin Mitchell, ZL1KFM. Yep. yep. And there we are in Starbucks. We didn't have any LMP or crunchies there. No, we could have ran over next to Taco Bell next door, though. We could have. <laughs> that would have been an awful thing to do to a nice fellow that brought us. Yeah. We we had a good time. We we met him and his family, and then, of course, we, we snuck him off to Starbucks and, and had some ham conversation. Yeah. Yeah, it was a nice visit. Yeah. Um, glad, he, glad he looked us up when he was coming through. I am, and we'll be seeing him again in... At, at Hamvention, right soon here. We may have to point another camera in his direction. Arnie, Arnie says no Hamvention for him this year. He's saving money for a rig pie and a 9700. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I would do that too, Arnie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is a pretty good... Um, it's a pretty good incentive not to go to Hamvention. <laughs> yeah. You know, we just shot a video of the 9700 here with Ray. Just got it edited and ran through all the approvals yesterday. It, sh it should probably post on Monday. Mm -hmm. So it's 50-something uh, minutes of detailed information and playing with the IC9700. 9700 goodness. And it's pretty cool. You know, back when I was only a technician, if that thing had come along... Oh, uh, yeah, you I had been drooling all over that thing. Yeah. I would have, because VHF and UHF were just, you know, the only thing I operated. And I never had a base station. You know, there just aren't that many VHF, UHF base stations around. Not not all mode, that's for sure. No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And th this one is. If you get a chance, uh, you'll see it posted around. It, it should be on the ICOM America YouTube page next week. Uh, go check it out. If you're thinking about one of those rigs, you definitely want to see this. Yeah, but uh, when it comes out, uh, try to watch for it and post a link yeah. on uh, the social media accounts that we got left. Yeah. Sherwood Engineering has already got that radio tested. Uh, must have, may have been a sample, but they've they've got it up on their website. Uh -huh. Cool. Yeah, it's nice. It's a nice rig. Oh, very nice. Yeah, it would match a 7300 or 7610 perfectly. Mm -hmm. You know, I was I was puzzled. I was talking with a friend the other night uh, about the uh, the 9700, and we were kind of wondering why they didn't put six meters in it. But I think you just answered the question. I th I think ICOM was figuring that most folks would uh, already have an HF rig, and most of the HF rigs already have six meters anyway. Yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, not 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 a deal breaker by any means. And there are some interesting things that that we discussed in this video, and one of them was the bandwidth of mm -hmm. the radio. It's not like the receiver's DC to daylight. It only covers the ham bands, and there's a very good reason for that. It, it doesn't cover in between the bands, and that's so that they can make the front end real tight on that thing, and it's really sensitive and rejects noise real well. Mm -hmm. So it, it is optimized for use on the hand bands. Yeah, and the only part of that radio that, as far as I understand, that's an actual transverter is the uh, 1296 uh, band in there. Uh, the rest are, are actual uh, real radios for uh, for 2 and uh, 440. Yeah, direct direct sampling. Direct sampling, yep. yeah. Uh, like I say, you need to go check that out. There's so many more details in there that things I didn't know about it that yeah. like like the high speed data mode is really sweet. Yeah. It's really very usable data rates coming out of it. Yeah, the uh DSP for VHF and stuff. Yeah. I've never really even thought about that, but it's pretty cool stuff. Me neither. Well, before we got sidetracked on some good radio discussion there. We were talking about hats. And this, we not, were. Not that this is not radio discussion, too. But I got a couple of photos here that came from our friend to me over in Finland. And there's the hat right there. N-O-T-A, Finland. Nordics on the air. And it's a youth on the air 
R1 sub-regional camp for 2019. Cool. It's an event for you that they have over there, and this is the station operating right here, OH2YOTA. Awesome. Look, the hat is right there in the middle of all and of it. And showing them that you can do it with style. With style, <laughs> yeah. We got one more hat photo here. And this one comes from somebody who calls himself cheap. You wouldn't think they'd be riding around in a pickup like yeah, this. Nice truck. That's uh, the cheap old man email. And his cheap old hat. And his cheap old hat. And that doesn't look like the one the dog chewed on, I don't think. He must have a spare. <laughs> he must. Must have got another one, and that is... Could be the uh, so Michigan. Is it the Michigan Speedway? Could be. With all those hats there, Tommy, what if I wanted a hat for myself? Where could I go? You can get hats, T-shirts, jackets, all kind of goodies at amateurlogic.spreadshirt.com. We've got Amateur Logic and some Ham College swag there. We've got some cool Ham College sweatshirts, although uh, winter's about gone. Uh, compliments of Mr. and Mrs. VE3MIC yep. design. Yeah, that, uh, those are nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah, very nice. Very classy. But anyway, you can get them there. And by the way, if you already have yours, it's probably a little late to order them and get them in before Dayton. But if, you, if you've got your swag, uh, wear it around Dayton. And uh, anyway, do some representing. I always like seeing the stuff running around there. Mm-hmm. I'll have mine on. Just keep talking while I dissolve this yeah. chocolate. Oh, you really did get some more. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. For a minute there, I thought you were going to say, if you show me yours, I'll show you mine. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> it's the Michigan Speedway. Miss Speedway. That's what Chip says. Yeah, it's Michigan. That's what, that's what I said he was. I don't know. Yeah, that's where uh, MISpeedway.com is not high speed. <laughs> oh, well, I can't see. <laughs> I didn't have my glasses on. Yeah. That's the uh, site of where the uh, Great Lakes, I think it's called the Great Lakes Ham Fest. It's a, it's a relative new one. They're trying to really get that one going. Um, but it's so late in the, uh, in the season. I think it's actually, uh, oh, I don't want to say for sure because I could be wrong, but it's, it's at it's after um, you know Labor Day in September. Um, mm -hmm. I think it might be even be October November, um, but I haven't heard any news yet uh, to see whether or not they were able to keep that thing going. I know it's only been around for two years, so it's hard to say. Marty says it's the Michigan International Speedway in Southeast Michigan. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Well, cool. I hope they uh, hope they do well. I think it's a competition type thing up there so it is yeah i hope, hope the sun's team does well yeah they it's a team on um i, I i'll get it wrong so i probably shouldn't say but it's on building uh, designing building automotive mm -hmm. stuff and uh, looks they had a nice looking oh yeah they put yeah. together there. very cool so uh, on our way out the door here, a couple of things we want to mention. Throughout the month, uh, we check in, and you can check in with us there at our social media clubs. That's uh, facebook.com slash group slash amateurlogic.tv. And we're also on Twitter at Amateur Logic and at Ham College. And we also have a Instagram account. Amateur Logic Instagram account, and usually only post things to there um, from Hamfest and things like that. But we got the biggest Hamfest in the world coming up, so you may want to keep an eye on it because there's a good chance I'll be posting some pictures on there. Okay. We'll be, yeah, we'll you, be you should watch. That. You should watch for that. <laughs> I should. You may see yourself in there. Hmm. I guess you I never could. Know. Yeah. And our wiki. Yeah. AmateurLogic.tv slash wiki is where our friend Dan in on LVS puts the show notes up for you. AmateurLogic.tv forward slash wiki. And with that, Mike, it's, uh, it's great to see you back again. And glad that you could fill in. It was mighty big shoes to fill tonight, but <laughs> you did it eloquently. I hope I did email proud. Um, 
and uh, thanks for letting me s- step in for you uh, while you're away at the uh, Michigan Speedway. And it was a very good segment you had there too. Um, yeah, it was great. That was, that was really interesting. I didn't know that that was that was around. Yeah, I, he's been working on on a. I think around November it came out of last year, and it's been kind of in his garage. And the garage is where uh, David um, uh, P A seven L I M he uh, puts all of his projects that he's kind of like uh, a work in progress type of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, of course, there's there's no support uh, for something like that, but uh, any of those kind of projects uh, he usually keeps in the garage section of his website. But uh, it's pretty it's pretty cool. I've been using it for quite a while, and uh, I like the fact that uh, I can have the Ambi server set up downstairs and uh, just fire up one of my uh, Android devices, and away I go. Yeah, I, I was aware of that, but I haven't really taken the time to set it up. But I may have to go and do that. I was totally unaware. <laughs> so it was good to see that. I, I appreciate it. And I don't know. I'll have to look and see if, uh, well, I don't know. I've got so many things going on. But that that sounds like something that I would like. Yeah. One of those. Cool. Tommy, so, mean, what are you up to next? I'm going to Hamvention. Okay. I'm going to Hamvention, too. I suspect by next month we'll probably have some Hamvention coverage. We're lucky. I suspect that we will, and I still don't have my shopping list ready. I've got to get busy. Yeah, same. I've got a, I've got a one thing I may get. I think I might get one of the Zoom spots, possibly, to travel yeah. with. So, anyway. That could be nice. Well, thanks for watching, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us again, Mike. We look forward to seeing you again soon. And we hope to see some of you in Xenia at the fairgrounds there for a hamvention next week. Yeah, be sure and look us up if you see us walking around. All right. 73, everybody. 73. 73, and on behalf of Emil, stay cheap. <laughs> <laughs> she did that well. Anyway, that you know, they're, they're having a good time in there, and uh, who could blame them? Oh. And he said, "Oops!" When he yeah. turns on the scope, he sees Mike's picture. <laughs> <laughs> I could see that as being a big issue, you know. We turn on the air conditioner in between uh, when we're playing videos here, when when we remember to. <laughs> and the infrared remote for the air conditioner apparently is on uh, got similar codes to the sign right here <laughs> because it it will throw the color off on the, the sign. The funny thing would be when you change the color on that if the air conditioner come on. It's no telling. It, it's probably really broad blanded and splatter. Broad blanded <laughs> too, yeah.